Kevin, can you see the slides and can you yeah, hear me? Yeah. Okay. So we talked all this. I may be able to skip a few slides here, and we know that what is most important is not only that the luminaries uh, are good, but it improves. And you can see in five years there's a positive remodeling with the absorb stent, which is clearly what what we want: more lumen and no metal, and that's important. But unfortunately, when it came to the real world studies, we saw that you know there was uh, the target lesion revascularization failed. in the randomized studies and favored the metallic stents and so the issue was really the safety of the stent in the acute period and maybe in the late period and the issues were why was this issue it was very really clearly known that when we were using type a lesions uh, and very uh, doing the initial studies that we were getting good outcomes but when it came to larger studies we started getting into trouble with the absorbed stent and the reasons were pretty clear to us because we did about 200 absorbs one about 170 with uh, imaging guidance and this was one of the papers we published uh, in um, international journal of cardiology when uh, we we noticed in the first stent from bosses uh, in a proximal lady which looked angiographically optimal we shifted over to ct guidance for everybody uh, for the next 170 patients and this was a small study which we looked at about Uh, uh, a small group of 36 scaffolds in 27 patients we we had two operators doing the case who got a great result after the angiogram the oct was then used to to look at the lesions and then went further optimized and what is interesting is that despite all the further optimization about 60% of the absorbed scaffold was still uh, in 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 sort of classical terms under deployed there was about under expansion still in 61% there was geographic miss in about 8% tissue prolapse in one fourth patients some irregularities and some malpositions despite going up on the balloons and doing our best in trying to to do the technique and remember this was all done this psp and all that sort of stuff but what is interesting is when we followed these patients up we had only four events and these four events happened in the non uh, in a uh, non uh, you know treated vessel so it's very important that imaging really helped you one to make suitable adjustments uh, after the procedure it would have been even better if you do do prior to the procedure so that the psps can be optimized number two we will be left with some sort of under deployment in the classic terms if you look at the lumen we need 90% plus uh, you may be left with but The important thing is, if you don't have major under deployment and major dissection, then you don't get bad outcomes. And so, this was published by us in 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 the International Journal of Cardiology. Now, the second issue we all talked about the first generation BBS. They are bulky uh, and they are difficult to deploy. Their structural integrity may be a problem when they dissolve. And I think that they're a little bit difficult to deploy in small vessels. And I think the, what Dr. Colombo said that. you know whether it is be a metallic stent or a bbs you need to deploy them after lesion preparation otherwise you're not going to get long term good outcomes and it's more so with the brs than the metallic dbs so the two issues we need to do is we learn very quickly is improve your technique and improve your device and the improve the technique is by using the pre dilatation stent sizing and post dilatation uh, we as a group always image patients we almost image most of our even a normal bare metal stem um, normal regulating stents today and many of our patients especially the complex cases get always imaged we the issues of dapt are also issues how long we give it for these patients and it's important that these are not the traditional stents so we have issues with dapt which we need to decide how long to give it obviously the device getting improved especially the new vrs from metal is a thinner strut makes life simpler and 100 micron i think is a very very suitable device and the mechanical properties in terms of the scaffold in terms of the uh, you know the markers and the strength of the scaffold and the coverage of 25% is important because that will help us patients to get better outcomes technique is very very important and i think all the speakers have said this is same issue that you need to have technique you need to have good outcomes in terms of uh, the deployment no major dissections and you need to have uh, uh, in my opinion 
a good idea before you go in and after you get out to get the optimal results. And unfortunately, however good we are as angioplastias, uh, the, the, the eyeballing of the coronary sometimes is, is wrong. And we have two papers now, a recent paper which we now presented at the TCT uh, from our centers. And what we showed clearly that almost even after a lot of experience with angiography, you know, you will three-fourth the time not correctly be able to guess the size of the vessel which imaging will help you with. So the PSP is basically very simple. You prepare the lesion, redilate one is to one. For calcified lesions, you will debulk. You will size the scaffold correctly. And you know we were also part of the Illumin 4. And we clearly realized that even with simple lesions, we completely you know, deferred when we sought the patients in terms of the stent sizing. So I think it's important to size and there's no better way than imaging to make this decision. Post dilatation is extremely important because these scaffolds are not lit metal and they need to be pushed in harder into the vessel wall. And as Dr. Columbus said, high pressure implantation is more so with the BRS uh, technology uh, than the metal stand. And I think we should strongly consider IV imaging uh, when you have uh, lesions which are either type B2 or C or in patients with small vessels or otherwise, or if you have any doubt. So I don't think it will be mandatory, but I think in the initial learning curve, we should not make the mistakes we had with absorb. So I think that these were the issues of the first generation I'm not going to do. And I, we have the second VRS and we're talking second VRS, which is Merrill with 100 microns, which is a great sort of way to go ahead with the whole thing. So I think what we need to really clearly understand is two things. One, there is an acute performance, which affects safety and the second part is the long-term efficacy and the disappearance of the stent, which comes after that. So without these two issues really being in sync, then we will not get any difference in terms of outcomes as compared to the, to the, to the, to the current generation, uh, third generation DES. So this again, I'm not going to go ahead, but for the two cases which I'm going to show, which are very specific, what is important is these markers. I think these markers are great because they help us to clearly not overlap these stents. We don't want 200 microns overlap. That's the first thing. And the most important thing is low recoil. And these two things are extremely important for the stent, uh, apart from the shelf life, which is longer, and the issues with uh, deployment. So we clearly know the, 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 the crossing profile is comparable to a resolute integrity. And that's really important for us because we can use these stents in difficult lesions. And I told you about the markers. And these are very, makes it very life simple. There's a tip marker where the balloon ends and there's three markers at the tip of the stent, which we can see not much of overhang. So no distal dissection when you go up. And I think it's very easily seen on any fluoroscopy, which was difficult with the abs of stent. So we've talked about this golden tube. And I think that the important issue we need to talk about is how do you use it in practice? So this is a 40 year old gentleman clearly a young guy, we don't want metal in him. We have a few of, uh, I think about half a dozen patients now deployed uh, under imaging. So I'd like to share two cases very quickly. 40 year old diabetic, inferior volumide evolved with very mild alveolar dysfunction, came with chest pain with a small troponin high, referred from another hospital. So you go in, do it an angiogram, it looks like a straightforward lesion. So we considered VRS for this patient. We did an OCT and it's important that we put in all the technology and we have the uh, co-registration here to measure the lesion. And you can see that the lesion, there is disease all through the segment. It's not so focal as what the angiogram shows. It's a bit longer and it, you can see it's, it's clearly about uh, a little longer than what we think it is. So the important thing is that we decided then that we need to, because we had at that point of time, we had only restricted lengths that we need two stents to do this procedure. And now the issue is an overlap with the BRS, which is very, very important how you decide. So you first pre-dilate very well, the PSP way. We measured it, it was three millimeters uh, in the distal vessel. So we had no problem. We went to the 315 NC track. And what we can see, we deployed the first 10 proximally 332 MRES. The whole length was about 40 millimeters. We now need two stents. 
And the important here is that we put the proximal one first, because I think this is important decision because you have a worry after you deploy the stent and then you can't get the other stent through what will happen. But the, we, we have a large comfort with this stent because of the easy track of no pushing of guiding, nothing required, no strong wires, no double wires, nothing with the stent. It behaves a bit like the metallic stents of the third generation. So you put a 332 Meris, you go up to high pressures of 20 atmospheres with the 38 NC track. And I'm not going to go to this first OCT because I just go to the next thing. We we post dilated and easily got a 3 into 16 MRES down. And there was no difficulty at all getting the second stent down. And we could easily overlap it without having much uh, scaffold overlap. And we went up again with high pressure dilatation. And you can see after that, it looks definitely a little under deployed. So therefore, we go in with again an OCT. And now you can see on code registration, that's where the first stent will start. And then you can see some amount of little bit of malposition distally. As you come back, you can see Again, we need some work done. We need to push it back. Uh, you can see parts of the stand uh, still needing work. And we have some good results in the tape. And this is what OCT tells us in terms of the within the vessel, how much work to do. So we went up again with a 3.5 high pressure in the proximal and a, and a, and a 3 over with a higher pressure distal. And this is the final angiogram result. And then we do another OCT and uh, that was a perfect result at the final OCT. And then we have a one year angiogram of this patient. And you can see clearly how nicely these are embedded inside the vessel with a perfect lumen and a nice result. So what it tells you is that if you use OCT, you can measure the lengths properly. You can size your vessels correctly. You can look at your PSP. We did one more city for the interest of time. I didn't show you that, but we clearly saw a good result with that. We could implant the first stent, do a high pressure within that, and go through the first stent with the second stent, get a good outcome at the end of the procedure, post dilate it again, and have a one year good angiographic follow up in terms of the OCT. Now, this is the second case, and this is again something unique which Meris provides, and that is the tapered Meris. So, this is another young patient, 51 year old, diabetic, anterior wall MI, lies with STK referred from outside with mild LV dysfunction. And you can see again a long lesion, small vessel. So, we just went down, did a high pressure balloon dilatation uh, prior to doing the first OCT, and again a co registered OCT. And you can see again that there is a long segment of disease. The distal vessel is about 2.5. The proximal vessel EEL to EEL is 3.5. Uh, and so we now know there's a long length of stent that we need to do and we need to overlap too. So what we now do is once we prepare the bed very, we've got nice dissections. We got good, uh, a good sort of uh, opening of the vessel. We, we go in with the 2.53 40 millimeter MRES, that is 2.5 distally and opens up three in the proximal. And this is what we did. We put a, a tapered Meris 40 with two diameters proximal distal and then post dilating 2.5 and three. Then we put the overlap 3 or 29, again overlapping it absolutely correctly so that we get the minimum overlap. The post 10 dilatations were then done with the 3.25 NC track and a 3.58 mosaic in the proximal and the distal part and we do another OCT I'll show you the yeah so this is how the OCT looks like and you can see that there is despite all the precautions we took there was a small area of overlap but you know we know again that we have further work to be done and this is that little bit of overlap area of, of the absorbs, uh, sorry, of the meris. And then we do a higher pressure dilatation. And we are very comfortable with this with OCT because the EL to EL is 3.5. So you can go up very strongly with your balloons and deploy them extremely high pressure through the stand. And this is what you get 
finally that you get again a co-registered co OCT and you can get a reasonably good deployment all through. And this patient had a, had a one year CT scan, which again showed a perfect result. And this is what I think that we should be doing. We should go about doing these cases in a systematic manner. And if you're using the start of technology, do it in a proper way, use imaging. And then maybe as Dr. Columbus said, maybe in extremely small vessels, which are distal, use a DEB and not even put a stent. And I think a metal-free stent uh, in the future would be the way to go. Thank you very much for uh, listening to me on this presentation.